I am with our basic radar training system, the AD96-10. It includes a radar antenna with its rotating pedestal, a radar transmitter, radar receiver, a radar synchronizer and antenna controller, the power supply, a dual channel sampler, could include an optional oscilloscope that you would need to look at the various signals in the system, as well as all the leads, uh, the antennas, and the manuals included to be able to work with the exercises for this subsystem. It also includes a target positioning system that allows you to study radar characteristics for various target trajectories. In the first book, the students would learn the principles of radar systems, including basic principles of pulsed radar, the range delay relationship, radar antennas, the radar equation, radar transmitter and receiver, antenna driving system, continuous wave radar and the Doppler effect, frequency modulated continuous wave radar, and three exercises on troubleshooting, in this presentation, I will show you the signal flow for a pulsed radar. To install the module, you simply stack them on top of one another. Each module has a power connection on the bottom. And if you look on the top, you will see that it does have a door. And inside that door, you have access to additional test points, as well as fault insertion switches to teach troubleshooting. So here, I will just stack it on top and voila. The first module on the top is the radar transmitter. It has an RF oscillator that works at a calibrated frequency of 9.4 gigahertz in the X band. But you can also change the frequency by selecting the variable function anywhere between 8 and 10 gigahertz. It's also possible to use frequency modulation. In that case, you have control around the carrier frequency of 9.4 gigahertz for your frequency and for your deviation of the carrier frequency. It also has a control voltage monitor output so you can see what is the actual frequency just using a regular oscilloscope or multimeter. This is followed by an isolator which prevents the signal bouncing back into the oscillator. We then have a switch for our RF power and this uh, continuous wave can go to an SMA connector here for our main signal. A small part of it will be sampled through the directional coupler to be used in the demodulator. Now if I want to do continuous wave radar, I can take the output directly from here or if I want to do FM uh, radar, I can take it from here as well. But in the demonstration I want to do this morning, I want to do pulsed radar. So I will use a pulse generator here uh, where I can select my pulse width anywhere between 1 and 5 nanoseconds, uh, which is extremely short because I want to have a very fine range resolution in the classroom. This allows me to have a resolution in the order of 6 inches or 15 centimeters. The output of my pulse generator will go in my pulse input to give me a pulsed signal. So let's connect here. My continuous wave radar and the pulse generator. Now I will need to take the pulsed RF output and send it to my antenna. So I'm connecting my pulsed RF output to the rotating antenna pedestal because I want to do a PPI display. But it could also be sent to a single horn antenna to do, for example, a Doppler radar or a continuous wave radar. So what is inside this uh, rotating antenna pedestal? So my pulses go into the RF input 
I do have a circulator that will send my RF input to the antenna through a rotary joint, but will prevent most of the input from bleeding into the output. The signals that will come back, so the echoes, will go through the circulator, won't go to my RF input, but will go to my RF output. I also have a motor power input here to uh, be able to change the direction of my antenna. I have shaft encoders outputs that I could read on the oscilloscope if I want to look into those details, but mostly I will use the motor feedback output connected directly to the controller. Now the output of my RF will need to go back to my radar receiver. So I connect the return of my antenna to the RF input of the radar receiver. It first goes through a power divider. One of the channel will be mixed with a local oscillator input, which I can take directly from my radar transmitter. So to be sure to always have signal coming back, I am creating two channels. One I channel where I multiply with the sine of my wave and one where I multiply with the cosine of my wave. I'm going through further power dividers. The main channel of interest to me is just going through a wideband amplifier to get my pulses back. I have this for the I channel and the Q channel but I also have a low-pass filter at 1 kHz if I wanted to do continuous wave Doppler output. In that case, I would have used the continuous wave output on my transmitter instead of using the pulse output. I also have the option of using a high-pass filter to do FM continuous wave output. So these two channels will need to be uh, looked at on an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope that would be able to look at one nanosecond pulses would be quite expensive, so we will need to use a trick to be able to use less expensive equipment. The I and Q channels from the radar receiver will go into the dual channel sampler. This will be used to take the very narrow pulses in the order of 1 to 5 nanoseconds and stretch them by a factor of 1000 to get pulses in the order of 1 to 5 microseconds, which will be a lot easier to look at on the oscilloscope. The radar synchronizer is used to generate the pulse repetition frequency. So the pulse generator trigger input will be connected to the synchronization signal. And this can be uh, changed by one of those knobs here. The PRF can change between 12 pulses per second, 16, 144, 216 or 288 pulses per second. Uh, you also have the option of using a staggered PRF. This signal also has to be sent to the dual sampler along with the PRF itself. The dual sampler has uh, an origin compensation to compensate for the length of the cables going back and forth to the antenna. Also, a span selection between 1.8 meters to 7.2 meters, so roughly between 6 and 25 feet as your maximum range. 
it has an A-scope time base output to be able to look at your signal on a regular oscilloscope, gain adjustment, and DC offset compensation adjustments. We then have the I and Q channel outputs that can be sent either to the oscilloscope or to a PPI display or to further processing. The radar synchronizer module also has antenna controller functions. We will need to connect the motor feedback from the antenna base and the output of this controller will go into the antenna motor drive. We have the choice of using a manual speed selection, a PRF lock speed selection, or a track scan mode where this input here can be used to select the direction of the motor. With that, you also have an azimuth output that can be sent to a computer for digital PPI display. And on the front panel, you have the display of the actual position and speed of the motor. I will complete the connections by connecting the motor feedback from the antenna base, as well as the power output of the antenna motor driver directly into the rotating antenna pedestal. On the oscilloscope, I will first connect my time base to the channel 1. And we see that this signal here gives us a ramp that is beginning at the origin time and going up as time progress and will be reset by the sending of the next pulse. I will use this as a trigger source. And the second trace will be the signal that is of interest to me, either my I or my Q channel. The A-scope time base could also be connected to the external trigger input if I wanted to look at both the I and Q channel at the same time. But for now, let's say that I just connect one of the channels to my oscilloscope here. I stopped the antenna rotation and made sure that my antenna is pointing at an actual target. I am in the calibrated mode, so at a fixed frequency of 9.4 GHz. Now I will need to adjust the origin on the machine until I see that actual reflection here. Now what I will see is Repetitions of these because I'm catching multiple PRFs, multiple pulses at the same time. Now I need to know which of these signals is actually of interest to me. Well, you have always a series of reflections that is caused by the rotary joints and all of the active connections at the beginning of your uh, echo trace. So if I point to a place where there is actually no target, I see that all of these are fixed reflections here. And this is my actual target that is appearing and disappearing. One crude way to remove these is just to change the origin until you don't see the fixed echoes anymore. So this is roughly uh, a proper adjustment for my uh, distance. But it would be better to use a tape measurement, measure the actual distance of the target, and calibrate that with the radar equation that gives you the distance, the range relationship. I also want to avoid having multiple reflections, multiple pulses here, so I will change my time base to have just one on the screen. Now, if, if I change the distance of my target, I see both a butterfly effect as well as a change in 
the distance of the echo. You can also see the phase going from full positive to zero to full negative. And when it is zero, this is where the other channel would be maximum in that case. The rest of the tricks will be to do proper processing of these to get a nice PPI display that displays only things you want to see actually on the radar.